Well, church, it comes to me to introduce the speaker. I've heard of Nicardo about three years ago when he was just a little boy. He might be big in size, but he's little in age. Nicardo was, I think he was one call, called by God. He starts, originally he's from the island of Jamaica. He went to America when he was three years old. Two? Two years old. He was, he was from, well, originally his passport said Jamaica. Right. He got baptized at eight. He started preaching at nine. Nicardo gave his first baptism. That means he baptized at 16. He's baptized over 100 persons, a people. And he's only a teen. He's only a teen. His aim is to be a pastor and to make it to the kingdom. And I was told a couple of years ago, Nicola said, when he become a president, right, he's going to do things different. Right. He's got really big ideas for being for pastors. One of his ideas is the pastor's got targets. And if they don't reach the targets, he'll fire them. <laughs> oh, you <he'll> know. <laughs> right. um, Nicardo is very con very conscious person. And he's been used by God. Amen. He's here this week with us. And I'm just asking the church, please pray for him. And Nicardo, your audience. But before we hear from Nicardo, can we hear? All right, Nicardo will say. <laughs> good morning, church. Well, rather good afternoon, but um, we'll just act like it's morning. Somebody ought to say amen. Can we act like it's morning? No? All right, all right. That, you know, that's what I figured. We can act like it's morning. And, and it, it's morning where I'm from. You know, it's 6 a.m. over there. Um, but it's so good to be here today. Oh, yeah, at Oakland. It's so good to be here today. I don't know where Blossom got some of that uh, information from about me. Um, it was very interesting that she would say some of those things. Um, <laughs> I don't intend on firing pastors. <laughs> That's not my goal. Um, all I was saying was that, um, you know, when you get hearsay, you know, in Jamaica, they have a saying, here's a can go a court. All right. <laughs> you know, when you get hearsay information, you know, it's, it's never conveyed correctly. All I was saying was some pastors don't do their job, and so they would have goals. And if they didn't meet their goals consistently, and the goals would be reasonable, if they didn't meet their goals consistently, then, you know, like any other job, they deserve to be fired. fired. You know, if you're a teacher and you don't teach, you deserve to be fired. If you're a counselor and you don't counsel, you should be fired. Yeah. And you know, if you're a pastor and you don't pastor, you should be fired. So, you know, well, I don't know if they're going to vote me to be a president one day, though. But anyhow, it's good to be here. Um, I'm so happy that I made it. Some of you were here last night, and I told you that um, this has been my first transatlantic uh, trip. You know, I've gone to Bermuda, but that's not really transatlantic. That's just kind of a hop over. But, uh, yeah, this was a long way. And, you know, I'm just so happy that the Lord brought me um, to be with you all for this time. I just want to share um, some thoughts with you before um, we get into the message. I just want to uh, ask for your prayer, for your prayers um, during this week. It's going to be an awesome week. I'm already feeling it, and I know that God is going to do some amazing things through us this week. He's going to use this to touch some people that would not have been touched by the gospel. And let me tell you, 
that someone's life is going to be changed this week. Remember that we said that someone's life is going to be changed this week. And, and I'm not saying that to boast or to brag. I'm saying that based upon the authority of God's word. Somebody's life is going to be changed this week because they're going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And all the gospel is is the good news that Jesus came and he died for us so that we don't have to die. We don't have to die forever. In fact, we don't have to die. We just go to sleep and one day we'll wake up and we'll be with Jesus again. That's the good news. And someone this week is going to accept that good news. They're going to accept the good news of salvation and they're going to decide to walk with Jesus again. There may be some people who have fell off the way a long time ago, and they too will make a decision for Jesus this week. But God needs us to do more than just pray. The Bible tells us that faith without works is what? Dead. D-E-A-D. There's no life there. It's not breathing. It's not worth anything. It should just be thrown in the ground and just cover it up with some, cover it up with some dirt. So what we're asking is that everybody would invite somebody to the meeting. Somebody ought to say amen. Has anybody invited anybody yet? Oh, Lord, have mercy. Can we, can, can we make a deal? That if I show up to preach tonight, that you'll invite somebody to come? Anybody want to make that deal with me? Mercy. Anyhow, we, um, I'm, I'm inviting you to um, invite people to come out to the meetings. The most you can do, you know, the least you can do is invite them. And, um, you know, just throw it out there and see who will be interested, who will catch it, who won't. I know that someone's life is going to be changed this week. And, um, by the way, we are our brother's keeper. And it's your responsibility to invite those friends, some people. You're the only Jesus that some people will ever meet. And so, you know, you have to capitalize on that opportunity. And trust me, ladies and gentlemen, for some of us, Jesus is going to look us in the face. And he's going to say, you had a next-door neighbor that you should have shared the gospel with, and you never shared it with them. Some of us, Jesus is going to look at it, and he's going to say, you had coworkers that you should have shared the gospel with, and you never shared it with them. And you'll say, but Jesus, I invited them to come to church once, and they never came. And he'll say, you should have been consistent. You should have continued to ask. You should have continued to be there. And some of us are Christians, and we've stopped living the life such a long time ago that we can't even tell people to come to church anymore because of the life that we live. They don't even believe that we're true Christians. But Jesus is holding us responsible for all of our behaviors, all of our actions. And so I encourage us all to, uh, to uh, reach out to those that are out there, those that are lost, those that are drifting, and uh, invite them to come to church. Amen? Amen. We're in the book of Acts, chapter 28. The book of Acts, chapter 28. All those of you that have allowed your Bible to come to church with you today, turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 28. The book of Acts, chapter 28. And we're looking at verse 1. Acts chapter 8, 28, verse 1. Those of you who are looking for it, say amen. Those of you that already found it, say amen. Oh, it's on the screen. Let's, uh, let's work with the, the text. The Bible says, And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. Go to the next verse. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us everyone because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarous, barbarians saw the venomous snake hang, beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. We're talking today on the topic, a change of mind. A change of mind. We all know who Paul was. Paul was an apostle of God. In fact, Paul had began his ministry as a Jew. He was a Pharisee. Paul was one of those people that would, would crucify Christians. He was one of those people that would persecute Christians. Paul was no, no, no kind fella. He was a rough man, and Christians were often afraid of Paul. Paul then went on to have his Damascus Road experience where God struck him down and told Paul that he was persecuting the Christians when he ought not be persecuting the Christians, but he ought to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And so Paul took
took the gospel commission and he ran with it and he began to tell people high and low that Jesus was indeed coming back again. He began to tell people that they ought to get their houses in order. He began telling people that they ought to, be, ought to repent and give their hearts to the Lord because Jesus was, in, 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 was, was no doubt coming back again. Paul was now a Christian, one who proclaimed Christianity and Paul even ended up in jail because of how much he proclaimed Christianity. And Paul was not afraid of the devil. He was not afraid of what the devil would do to him. He was not afraid of what the culture would do to him. He was not afraid of anything. Paul, all Paul knew was that he needed to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul spread the news everywhere to the point where he ended up in prison. Now Paul is in jail. He can have his case tried where he is or he can have his case, case tried in Rome. Paul says to himself, I'm going to have my case tried in Rome because if I have my case tried in Rome, I can speak to the emperor himself and I can get the emperor to know the good news of Jesus Christ. And if I can just talk to the emperor, then I have a chance of changing the whole nation. So Paul is now sent on this journey towards Rome. He's sent with soldiers and with other prisoners. They go by ship and, 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 and they're, they're traveling. And Paul says to them, don't launch out into the sea today. Paul says... I have a good feeling that we're going to get into an accident. Paul says, let's not go out. But they say, Paul, shut up. You're just a prisoner. You don't know what you're talking about. And so they set sail anyway. And I want to let you know, there's so much in this story to preach. I want to let you know that when God speaks, we ought to listen to what God has to say. Let me tell you that God has been God for a very long time. And he's not planning on retiring. He has never made a mistake. He's never lost a patient. And when God says something, we ought to follow what God says. The problem with many of us is that we don't follow what God says. And then when we blatantly disrespect God and we end up in a problem, then we call God and ask God to deliver us out of the problem. You know, some of us are lucky that I'm not God. If I was God, I mean, some folks would be in trouble because we don't do what he asks us to do. But then when we end up in problems, we ask him to help us out. But anyhow, so they, they ended up in problems. They, they, they ran into this storm and they began to throw things overboard, uh, overboard. I could imagine they threw their supply of food away. They threw their luggage away. They threw this away. They threw that away because they realized that the storm was too much. But God said to them, the storm, will, you will, nobody will die in the storm. God said, you're going to lose the ship, but no life will be lost. And, and and, and, and if we could just take those words in a symbolic type of way, it means something to me today to know that I might lose my ship. I might lose my shirt. I might lose my clothes. I might lose my, my dignity. I might lose my pride, but I won't lose my life. In fact, I know that one day if I stay faithful to the call that God has placed on my life, one day God will say, here is a crown of life. One day I'll be able to walk through those pearly gates and I'll be able to enter into the kingdom. I'll be able to sit with Jesus at the welcome table. I'll be able to lay down my burdens down by the riverside. That's good news. Somebody ought to say amen. So they run into this, this, this storm and the, the ship is broken apart and they begin to sail on broken pieces towards the land. And this is where we pick our story up. The Bible tells us that they escaped this storm. They escaped this struggle that they had gone through. And they got to the land and they realized that this island that they landed on was an island called Malta. And, and, and at Malta, there were some barbarous people there. And the barbarous people simply mean that they were people that were not converted. They were neither Jew nor Greek. They had not heard the gospel of Jesus Christ as yet. These people were, were, were not that they were uncivilized, but these people just had not been touched as yet. And these barbarous people, the Bible tells us, took them in and began to make a fire for them. The Bible says that the barbarous people showed Paul these prisoners and these soldiers kindness now it's interesting that barbarians who had not heard the gospel of Jesus Christ were the ones to show kindness to other people and it says something to us today that if we the people of God who had who know who Jesus is who have accepted Jesus folks who are blood washed folks that have been born again folks that have gone into the watery uh, watery pool of baptism if we the people of God know Jesus and we can't show kindness but yet these people that don't know Jesus showed kindness, there is a problem. 
The fact of the matter is that there are people who are shipwrecked by circumstances and they're looking for us. God is looking for us to show them kindness. What am I talking about? People who have been shipwrecked by bad marriages and God is looking, us to, looking at us to help take the pain away. There have been people who have been shipwrecked by bad circumstances, bad childhoods, bad things that have happened to them and God is looking for us to be his agents, his representatives, his ambassadors to the world to help take the pain away. God is looking for us us to help him he needs us to be his hands and somebody ought to say amen the problem is too many of us are not willing to be God's hands we're not willing to do what God has called us to do and no doubt we need to show kindness to other people Jesus gave us two commandments he summed up the ten commandments in two he said love God and he said love your neighbor the problem with many of us is we have the love God part down but we don't love our neighbor and I want to let you know that if you do not love your neighbor you do not really love God why because God God loves the neighbor. In fact, in fact, we need to get to the point where we're sold out to Jesus Christ so much that we'll do anything for those people around us. Hello, somebody. See, I'm preaching something that's kind of unpopular. I know it is. You know, just, just bear with me, y'all. If you really can't say amen, just say ouch. <laughs> say something like, get out my business, preacher. You know, just, you know, just, you know, you know, just entertain me. What I'm saying is we as God's people need to be kind. We as God's people need to be his representatives. We as God's people have a message that we need to take to the world and we need to do it fast. There are people who are shipwrecked by life and they are looking for us. They are looking for God's people to do something and we are too caught up in ourselves to the point where we can't even reach out to anybody else. We were talking about it last night. We were talking about the two points in history. I mentioned it last night. The two points in history where people were really Adventists. One was when Jesus had just left and people were waiting for Jesus to come back again. Two, they were Adventists in 1844 when they thought that Jesus was coming on October 22nd. Now, I want to let you know, I want to let you know, I want to let you know that the reason I can say boldly that those people were Adventists was one, because in the New Testament they were willing to sell everything and give it to the church to move the work of the Lord forward and two in 1844 they were willing to do the same thing now we aren't even willing to give a bible study I'm not talking about selling your house and selling your car. I'm just talking about reaching out to somebody. I'm not asking you to give everything away. I'm just saying pick up the phone and tell somebody there's church going on tonight. Would you like to come? These barbarians showed kindness and they did not know God. And we, the people of God who know him, who have a relationship with him, ought to be the ones that show kindness to the world. We ought to set the pace for the world, not everybody else. Everybody else sets the pace for us. We ought to set the pace. Everybody else shows us what true kindness is. All these organizations are doing these major things. We ought to be doing major things. We ought to be reaching out to the world. And the, truth of the, and the truth of the matter is we have the whole gospel. Some folks have bits and pieces of the gospel, but we have the whole gospel. We have everything that anybody ever needs. We have the answer. If you got health problems, we have a health message. If you, know, if you need to know how to be married, we can show you from the Bible. Any problem that you have, we have the answer. Why? Because we have the word of God, but we've been neglecting it for far too long to the point where people don't even know that we have the truth. I didn't come to argue with you, so let me move to my next point. <laughs> the next thing I want to show you from this text is that the Bible says in verse 3 that Paul went and gathered sticks. Now, it's interesting because Paul is sitting there. Or I can imagine that he's sitting around the fire. He just got out from the sea. He was wet, drenched, soaked. And here he is sitting around the fire. And as soon as Paul gets to the point of comfort, I don't even know if he really did get to the point of comfort. I don't even know if his clothes were dry. As soon as Paul gets there, all we know is that Paul begins to go and pick up sticks and add to the fire. Paul begins to help in kindness. Now this is interesting because some would say 
Paul is the one that's receiving kindness. Why does he need to engage in kindness? Paul is the one that was shipwrecked. Paul is the one who had bad circumstances. Paul is the one that's jacked up. He is the victim in this situation. Why is it that Paul is doing work? Why? Because God has called all of us to work. Whether you feel like a victim or not, God has called you to work. Whether you feel like you've been done wrong or not, God has called you to work. And let me talk to some folks who think that it's cool to leave the church. Let me tell you what happens when you leave the church. See, when you leave the church, you're not walking out on the pastor. Some of us feel, you know, I'm leaving the church because the pastor's jacked up, or I'm going to leave the church because of the elders, or I'm going to leave the church because of the people in the church. Let me tell you, when you leave the church, you do not leave the people of the church. You don't leave the pastor. Who you walk out on is God. Hello, somebody. See, 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 it doesn't matter if you're a victim. You need to do the work. Jesus was a victim. Trust me, he was. At 12 years old, his mother and father did not believe, even though an angel came to them 12 years before and told them that Jesus was going to be the savior of the world. Jesus was a victim. He grew up in Nazareth. And for those of you that don't know anything about Nazareth, Nazareth was the ghetto of the earth of that time. In fact, when they said, can any good thing come from Nazareth, they weren't trying to be funny. They were being realistic. Nothing good ever did come from Nazareth. Jesus was a victim, but even though he was the victim, Jesus became the victor. He engaged in the work, and even though he did not have the best circumstances growing up, Jesus was the one that was found healing the sick. He was the one that was found restoring sight to the blind. He was the one that was found preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, well, preaching the gospel of himself. He was the one that talked about the kingdom that was to come. He was the one who talked about living water, that if you drink of it, you will never thirst again. Jesus is the one that we find about the work even though he was the victim. Paul is doing the same thing. Paul is putting sticks on the fire, the same fire that was kindled to make him warm. Are you a victim? Maybe you are. Should you engage in the work? Absolutely. It does not matter who you are and what you have been through. You need to be about the work. Have I been victimized? Absolutely, I have. Did I grow up without a father? Absolutely. My mother is a single mother. I didn't meet my father until I was eight years old, and he hasn't done anything for me. Never made a major in a contribution to my life. In fact, it does not matter if he's dead. He's dead to me pretty much. We don't talk. We don't communicate. There is no relationship there. Am I a victim? Absolutely. Did I start preaching when I was nine? Absolutely. Have I been phased by it? Absolutely not. And we've all been through bad circumstances. And let me tell you what circumstances are. All circumstances serve to do is let you know who you need to minister to. You've been abused, yeah, okay, good. You've been abused, we've established that fact. We all understand that you've been abused. Okay, have you sought help? Yes, now you need to go and help somebody else. Have you had a bad marriage? Okay, yeah, it was rough going through that divorce. Okay, now what are you going to do? Sit there and mope all the days of your life? No, get up and go help somebody else. And when you help somebody else, it helps you. So Paul threw these sticks down on the fire. And he must have picked up a serpent when he picked up those sticks. And this speaks to how many sticks Paul actually picked up. If you pick up a serpent and don't realize that you picked up a serpent, you probably picked up a lot of sticks. <laughs> Paul picked up a whole lot of sticks and he went to throw them down on the fire. And as he went to throw them down, that serpent must have felt the heat. And he jumped out and jumped on the closest thing, which was Paul's hand. He jumped on Paul's hand and he fastened himself there. He fastened himself on Paul's hand. And these people said to themselves, the barbarians said to themselves, well, before we get there, I want to let you know that the devil is not going to allow you to engage in ministry and not do anything to you. Are you with me? The devil is not going to just let you go and not do anything to you. He is going to try to mess with you. He is going to try to jack you up. But I want to let you know that the Bible tells me that I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And even if you're alone when you're trying to do ministry, you plus God equals a majority. Somebody ought to say amen. 
The devil's not going to let you go out easy. He's not going to let you do the work easy. As a matter of fact, look at the disciples. Look at what happened to them. John got thrown into a vat of hot oil. Peter, I believe he was crucified upside down, beheaded. John on the Isle of Patmos all by himself. The disciples went through some rough stuff. No doubt you are going to go through something for Jesus Christ. But the Bible tells us that God will not allow us to go through anything that he cannot make a way of escape for us. In fact, the Bible tells us that he has made a way of escape for every one of our temptations. There is nothing that comes to us that is too big, nothing that is too great, nothing that with God's power we cannot defeat. So a snake is on Paul's hand. And the Bible tells us that the barbarians, the same ones that are showing kindness, look at Paul and they say he must be a horrible man. He must be a murderer. He must be worthy of every vile description. Why? Because God is punishing him. They looked at Paul and they said he escaped from the sea. But God is not playing games with him. He's going to die. And they sat there and they waited for Paul to die. And all Paul did was shake that snake off into the fire. And when they saw Paul shake the snake off into the fire, they stood there and they waited for him to swell up. They waited for him to fall dead. But the Bible tells us that Paul did not swell up. He did not fall dead. And they, the Bible says that they changed their minds. They said, for sure, this man is not a murderer. For sure, this man is not a criminal. For sure. This man is a God, little g. He's not a bad man. He's a good man. He's not what we thought he was. He's actually a pretty decent person. And some of us need to have a change of mind. We've been thinking the wrong way for far too long. We've been thinking the wrong things for far too long. We've been thinking the wrong things about other people for far too long. And we need a change of mind. We look down our noses at some people and we need a change of mind. Just because people are not in the same uh, class as us, we look down our noses on them. Some of us need a change of mind. <coughs> you know, it's interesting that God has people everywhere. And some of us have not come to terms with this whole idea of God having people everywhere. I want to tell you that it's true. God has people everywhere. You think that everybody else is jacked up. No, God has people everywhere. He has people in the Catholic Church. Hello, somebody. He has Pentecostals. God has Methodists. He has Anglicans. And let me tell you something. See, some of us think that God just needs us. Let me tell you, you're, in, you're dispensable. Yeah, God can get rid of you. See, he doesn't need any one of us to do his work. Really, God could just show up and do his work himself. But that'll probably scare the whole world, so he probably won't do that. But the Bible tells us that if we don't cry out, the rocks will cry out. God, we're not, we're not indispensable. God can get rid of us. Hello, somebody. I said all that to say that we need a change of mind. There are some people that we won't share the gospel with. There's some people that we don't even talk to. There's some people that we don't associate with. Why? Because they're not on our level. We feel that because we're Adventists that we are that. And let me tell you, the fact of the matter is most of us were jacked up before we became Adventists, if not still jacked up. Hello, somebody. You didn't always wear a long dress. You know, you used to wear a short skirt sometimes. You weren't always vegetarian. You used to eat pork. You used to eat lobster and shrimp. You know what I'm saying? You, you weren't always into health. You used to be... But it's only by the grace and glory of God that you're here today. And that same grace, that same love, that same kindness, we ought to show to everybody else. And I wish, and, and, and now y'all got me on my, on, my, on, my, on my high horse now. I wish that some folk in the church would share their experience with other people. Hello, somebody. 
I've come to the point where if you ask me my testimony, I'll tell you. Any question you ask me, I'll tell you. I'll be real with you. Because some folk won't tell you their testimony. They think that it's going to make them less of a person. Let me tell you, when you tell me your testimony, it makes you more of a person. Because in my mind, I, you're somebody who accepted Jesus Christ and turned from your wicked ways. It makes you more of a person in my eyes. I don't care if you're an elder or not. Tell your testimony. Got some folks in the church, they don't want to talk about where they've come from like it makes them less of a person. No, 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 no. Tell your testimony and it lets me know that God has this, the same God that did it for you. He can do it for me. Yeah. And I dare to say that some of our young people wouldn't do some of the things that they do if we would just share our testimony. Why? Because we feel like you haven't been there. We feel as though you've never walked the walk that I'm walking. Why? Because you don't act like you've ever walked it. All you do is talk Ellen White. <laughs> Hello, somebody. And I'm not, I'm not trying to offend you. And if you are offended, maybe it's because you didn't need to be offended. All you do is act like you ain't never been nowhere. Tell your testimony. Talk about how you were messed up. Talk about how you were on drugs. Talk about how you were loose. Talk about how you were all jacked up in your mind. But one day Jesus came and he grabbed hold of you. Tell somebody, let me know that there is hope for me. Let me know that if I put my hand in God's hand, he can transform my life. Tell somebody what God has done for you. The only reason why I'm still in the church is because there were real people who talked to me really. Only reason why I'm in the church is because of a pastor who would not mind sharing his testimony with me, letting me know that the same stuff I went through, he went through, and, to, and modeling for me what proper Christianity is. One reason why young people aren't interested in Christianity is because church folk haven't modeled proper Christianity. The Bible says train up a child in the way he should go, and when he grows older, he will not depart from it. And many people try to change the text. They say, well, well what the text is saying is that, 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 that it won't depart from the child. The gospel will never depart from the child. No, if you model Christianity properly, if you're a real Christian, one that's happy to be a Christian, when you show young people what real Christianity is, they will not be excited about leaving. The reason why young people leave is because they think Christianity is boring. They think it's drab. They think it's dry. They think it's nasty. It has nothing to offer them. Why? Because you don't show them what it has to offer. All you show them is the rough board meetings. All you show them is the gossip going on in the church. All you show them is the malice between members. All you show is nothing nice. You do not show the joy of Jesus Christ. We need to model proper Christianity. Some of us need to learn how to smile. Some of us need to learn how to talk to people. Just be joyous. Some people you talk to them and all they ever have to say is something negative. Some people I don't even ask them how they're doing. Why? Because they're going to give me a whole litany of complaints. My back hurts, my head hurts, my child, my this, my that. You ain't got nothing good to say? <laughs> you ask me how I'm doing, I'm wonderful. How's your day been? Great, excellent. I'm having an awesome time. Why are you so happy? Jesus is still alive. Amen. Some of us don't show the joy of Christianity. That's why folk don't want to come into the church. Not because they think that we all some... You know, not that they think that they don't need Jesus, not that they think that Jesus is not important, but we just haven't modeled it correctly. In fact, in fact, some of you, when you were choosing careers, you looked at, you probably went and shadowed people in their career. Am I right? Mm -hmm. And if you, well, some people say no, but if you, <laughs> I know that I, I've chosen a career path and I've, shadowed some people that have that are in their career and I tell you if every pastor I ever met was upset did not have anything good to say was not joyful I would not want to be a pastor 
Why? Because it says to me that being a pastor is jacked up. Hello, somebody. In fact, I know people, in fact, I know people that have, 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 have left, who were in school studying one subject, and they decided to study another subject because of their experience shadowing somebody. Are there any accountants here? All right, good, so I can say what I want to say. I have a friend that was studying accounting. She went to go and shadow an accountant, and she realized how much she did not enjoy the job. The accountant was just. And she decided she didn't want to be an accountant anymore. Why? Because it was just. If that's all people see about Christians is just. They're not going to want to be Christians. And that's been one of the biggest problems in the church. You know, while I'm talking about it, you know, we ought to offer our young people opportunities to do things that are fun. Hello, somebody. Why do I say that? Because young people want to have fun. I'm young. I know. We want to have fun. And if the church, if the church does not offer an alternative to what they have out there. I'm probably going to choose out there. If on Saturday night all you have me doing is sitting in the house reading the Bible, I'm probably going to want to go. Hello, somebody. And I'm not saying that reading the Bible is wrong. I love to read the Bible. I really do. I enjoy it. I'm not saying that I'm not condoning anybody's decision to leave the church, but all I'm saying is we need to make this thing fun. Some of us don't know how to make it fun because we've never had any fun. <laughs> you know, some people are just boring. You know, you talk to some people and it's just like talking to a wall. It's just like, what in the world has happened to you? Have you ever lived? Do you laugh? We need to show people the joy of being a Christian. And you want to know what the greatest joy of being a Christian is this? It is this. It is simply knowing that if we stay faithful, that Jesus is going to come back and take us to live with him forever. That's enough to be joyful about. Even if he does not do anything for you for the rest of your life, if you stay faithful unto him, you are promised to live with him forever. That's enough to be joyful about. Anyhow, I don't know how we got to that point. <laughs> but let's get back to the text. <laughs> Verse 5 says, and he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Some of us have beasts in our life that have been hindering us from being who God has called us to be. Some of us have beasts in our life that has been keeping us back from doing the work that God has called us to do. And all I have to say to you Dealing with your beast is shake it off into the fire. Shake it off into the fire. Yes, you may have a bad temper. Shake it off into the fire. Yes, you may have had a bad childhood. Shake it off into the fire. Yes, you may have had some bad things happen to you. Shake it off into the fire. Yes, you may be going through some trials and some tribulations. Shake it off into the fire. Yes, you may have been persecuted for Jesus' sake. Shake it off into the fire. Yes, you have gone through the fire. Yes, you have been through the flood. Yes, you've crawled, crawled you, 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 you've, you've climbed the mountains. Yes, there have been some rough times in your life. Shake it off into the fire. Yes, you may have been fired. So what? Shake it off into the fire. You may feel broke. Shake it off 
into the fire. You may feel like nobody likes you. Shake it up into the fire. No matter what is standing in your way from being who God has called you to be, you need to just go ahead and shake it off into the fire. Why? Because one day, Jesus is going to come back. And he's not coming back for people that have allowed circumstances to get in their way. He's not coming back for people who didn't do any work because of how bad their lives were. He's coming back for people who were willing to spread the gospel all over the world. In fact, he's coming back for some people who may have been persecuted for spreading the gospel all over the world. And I can imagine on that last day that some of God's people will be running. They'll be hiding in mountains and bushes because of what is going on in the world, because of the persecution that is there. They'll be running, and I can imagine that the whole earth will begin to quake. And God's people will look up, and they'll see the sky begin to roll back as a scroll. And they'll see Jesus sitting next to the Father like Stephen saw it in the New Testament. And they'll say, look at Jesus saying to the Father, can I go back now? I'm ready to go back and get my children. And the Father will look at Jesus and give him the nod and say, go back and get your children. Go back and get those who have been faithful. And I can imagine Jesus standing up and he takes off his priestly robe and puts on his kingly robe. And I can imagine Jesus saying that whoever is in in the state that they're in right now, that's the state they're going to be in forever. If they're filthy, let them be filthy still. If they're unjust, let them be unjust still. But those that are righteous, those that are clean, those that have not allowed the world to get to them, let them be righteous forever. Let them be clean forever. And I can imagine Jesus rounding up all the angels from glory, getting them together and saying to them, it's time now for us to go back. And I can imagine that triumphant parade as Jesus begins to come through the sky. I don't know if he's going to come through Orion. I don't know if he's going to pass, pass Pluto, Pluto. I don't know if he's going to pass the Mars or pass moon, pass the moon. or I, I don't know what Jesus is going to pass, but all I know is that Jesus will be coming back with a mission to come and save somebody. He, the sky is going to be rolled back as a scroll, and the Bible tells us that Jesus is going to be so awesome that he will not touch the ground, and Jesus will begin to send his angels forth and the angels will call people by name John Smith get out the grave and angels and people will just begin to pop out their graves like popcorn pop 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 cemeteries that were once dry places places of death and crying and mourning will no more be places of crying and mourning but they'll be joyful places triumphant places people will begin to pop out of their graves and they'll begin to go up into the air and we that are alive and remain we that have been faithful we that have done the work that God has called us to do will be caught up in the air to meet them and as we'll be caught up to meet them and as we're caught up we'll be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and this old corruptible shall put on incorruption this mortal shall put on immortality this jacked up shall put on unjacked up this person me yes a sinner shall be saved by grace I will be transformed back into the image of God and I will begin to sail through all of the uh, all of the universe all of the solar system on my way to glory I'll get there to heaven and not only will I get there but I'll get a mansion and the stuff that we wear for jewelry will be on my floor I'll go and sit at the welcome table with Jesus Christ I'll put on a long white robe no more short skirts no more tight shirts nothing but a long white robe I won't have to cook anymore because I'll be eating milk and honey. I'll have a good time in glory. Somebody ought to say amen. But what's more than that, what's more than just being with Jesus is that after a thousand years, the Bible tells us that that great city, New Jerusalem, will begin to come back down to the earth. The devil is going to get together all the generals that ever lived, all the wicked generals, those that died outside of Christ. He's going to get together all these war men, and they're going to say, let us take the kingdom. I can imagine that Napoleon will be in the number. I can imagine that this and that will be there, and they'll get together. 
and they'll go to take the kingdom. And as they go to take the kingdom, we'll be on the inside looking on the outside. The Bible tells us that the walls of the city will be made of jasper. It'll be, uh, it'll be clear, transparent. We'll be able to look through and some of us will be on the inside and some will be on the outside. And this is the only time in earth's history that everybody that ever lived will be at the same place at the same time. I plan on being on the inside. I don't care who's on the outside. My mother might be out there but I'll be on the inside. My brother might be out there but I'll be on the inside my schoolmates might be out there I'll be on the inside it'll break my heart to see them on the outside but I will have known that God is a faithful judge that he will not give anybody anything that they do not deserve fire will begin to rain down from heaven and that fire is going to burn sin it's going to burn the devil it's prepared for the devil and its angels and it's going to burn sinners up and that fire for them is something scary for that fire it's something to be afraid of for that fire it's something that makes you tremble but for me that fire cleanses for me that fire finally gets rid of sin for me that fire squashes all those pains and those troubles that I've ever had for me that fire stomps out Lucifer that old Satan that old devil that old dragon that messed with me for that fire that for me that fire is victory over sin and not only will they burn not only will the cars burn not only will the homes burn everything on the earth will be burned but almost as if we're watching television God will begin to replenish the earth he'll begin to fix the earth and this old jacked up place this place that the devil is wearing on this place that has hurricanes and tsunamis and earthquakes and tornadoes this place will be transformed into the oasis that it was in the beginning it'll be as if Garden of Eden, the Garden of Eden is all over the place and the new Jerusalem will rest on the earth and we'll be able to live in the new Jerusalem we'll be able to live in the new earth wherever we want to go there we'll be able to go and we will live with Jesus forever Amen. Amen. I want to be in that number I want to be with Jesus when he comes back again can somebody play something for me pass me not oh gentle savior I want to be with Jesus when he comes back again I want to be in that number and I know that there is somebody here who wants to be in that number also. Let me tell you one quick story. Now I'll make a call. In the 14th century, Robert Bruce of Scotland was leading his men in a battle to gain independence from England. Near the end of the conflict, the English wanted to capture Bruce, Bruce to keep him from the Scottish crown. So they put his own bloodhounds, his own dogs, on his train trail. When the bloodhounds got close, stick with me, y'all, Bruce could hear their, their baying. And one of his men said to him, Bruce, it's all over. The dogs are following your scent. Said, Bruce, we might as well just go out there and give up. We might as well say it's not worth it anymore. But Bruce replied, it's all right. Then he headed for a stream that was just a little bit down the way. Bruce plunged into the stream and he waded upstream a little bit. He got out on the other side. And these dogs chased him all the way to the stream. But when they got to the stream, they could not go any further because the scent was broken. There was no more trace there. Bruce had got out on the other side. And about two weeks later, he became the king. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you, all you need to do is plunge into that river that flows from Emmanuel's veins, and it will wash you, it will change you, and more than that, the scent of sin will disappear, and those dogs that the devil set on your trail to come and find you, the accuser of the brethren will not be able to find you anymore. Why? Because you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. You've been watched. I want to make two simple calls today. I want to appeal to two different categories of people. There's somebody here today, and I know there is because God is telling me that you're here, 
who needs to come down to the altar and say, I'm going to give my heart to the Lord. I'm going to go all the way with Jesus Christ. I'm going to start a relationship with him. I want to be baptized. If you're that person, I invite you to come meet me right down here at the front. I'm going to come down there and stand there. But more than meeting me, I want you to come meet Jesus. You're making a decision to be baptized. And there are some church folk here that have not been good Christians. You have not been what God has called you to be. And you want to say to yourself today, you want to say to God today, you want to say to the world today that you're coming back to Jesus and that you're going to be a good Christian. Two calls. I want someone to come down here who's going, who needs to be baptized. Forget wants to be baptized. You need to be baptized. You're going to come down front. And there's some church folks who are going to make a decision to rededicate themselves to Jesus Christ. And I'll invite you to just go ahead and stand where you are. If you're coming down to be baptized, come meet me down here, down front. And if you're a church person who's making a decision to, to rededicate your life to Jesus, I invite you to stand. Someone needs to make a decision for Jesus Christ. Someone needs to make a decision to come back home, to be baptized. If you're here today and you need to make the decision for baptism, I don't know who you are, I don't know what you've gone through, but today you're going to make your decision for baptism. You're out there and you need to come. I invite you to come now. Plunge into that fountain. Plunge into that fountain. You're here today and you need to be baptized. If you're that person, I invite you to come. I invite you to come meet me right down here. You need to be baptized. You need to be baptized. You need to be baptized. Maybe you've been baptized before and you recognize the need to be baptized again. I invite you to come now. Come now. Someone who needs to be baptized. You know the life that you've been living and you need to say, Jesus, I want to be baptized. Come now. Come meet me now. Come meet me now. Praise God. You're here and you need to be baptized. Come now. Come now. Come now. Come now. You want to say, Jesus, I don't want you to pass me by. Look, Lord, I know that you've been doing things in everybody else's life. And the reason why you haven't been doing anything in my life is because I haven't given you my life. But I want to be baptized. If you're that person, I invite you to come down here now. You need to be baptized. You need to be baptized. Wherever you are, I invite you to come now. Come now. Come now. You need to be baptized. You need it. Come give Jesus your all. Come give Jesus your life. You've been in control. Let God take a crack at it. Let God have control of your life. And see how wonderful it will be. Plunge into that fountain filled with blood. Come and give Jesus your all. Give Jesus your life. Give Jesus everything. Watch him make a masterpiece of your, a masterpiece of your life. Your life may have been jacked up. But you want to say today, let, I, I want to be back on the potter's wheel. I want Jesus to take my life. I want him to begin to shape it. I want him to fix it. If you're here today and you need to be baptized, I invite you to come down now. Come now. Come now. Come now. Come now. Come now. Church, your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. Come now. Someone needs to be baptized. Come now. You need to give your heart to the Lord. Come now. You may be upstairs. If you're upstairs, come now. We're waiting for you. You need to give your heart to the Lord. I invite you to come now. So I'm singing, Thirty seconds. I want you to think of these 30 seconds as the last 30 seconds of Earth's history. At zero, 
Jesus is going to come again. And if you know that you'd be lost if Jesus really did come at zero because you've never, you did not make the decision to be baptized that you should have made, then you need to come down here now. 30 to zero. Zero, Jesus is coming again. And if you know that you'd be lost at zero because you never made the decision to be baptized, you need to come down now. 30 seconds. 30, 29, 28. Jesus is coming back again. 27, 26, you need to make the decision to be baptized. 25, you need to get up out of your seat. 24, you need to say, I'm going all the way with you now, Jesus. 23, you're never too young and you're never too old. 22, I was baptized when I was eight. 21, 20 seconds till Jesus comes back again. If you'd be lost because you never made the decision, come now. 19, 18, this is a decision over life and death. 17, 16, 15, some of us are playing Russian roulette with our lives. 16, 15, 14, remember Jesus is coming back again. 13, and he's not coming back for some people that are half done. He wants people who are Christians, totally committed, dedicated, and sold out for him. 12, you need to make your decision to be baptized. 11, come down now. 10, you need to stand up for Jesus. There's something telling you, move, go down there. And you know that that's the Holy Spirit. The devil will not tell you to be baptized. And if there's a voice that's telling you, that's moving you, that's saying, go down there. That's the voice of God calling you. Don't tell God be quiet. Don't put him on the back burner. Don't try to shut him up. Stand up for Jesus now. Nine. Eight. You'd be lost at zero because you never made the decision. Seven. Come down now for Jesus. Six, five, four. You know that you need to make this decision for Jesus. Three, two. Jesus is coming again, y'all. You need to just come and make your decision. One, you haven't been living the life that you should have lived. Zero. Church, your heads are bound, your eyes are closed. We're having a word of prayer. Father, we come again in the name of Jesus. We thank you so much for what you have done in our lives. We thank you so much for ministering to us and for speaking to us today and letting us know that we need a change of mind, for showing us that like the barbarians, we need to be bringing kindness to the world, for showing us where we have gone wrong, where we've gone astray. And Lord, all of us, under the sound of my voice, have made the commitment. We're rededicating ourselves to you. We're giving our hearts back to you. We're giving our lives back to you. And we're saying, have thine own way. Lord, you're the potter. We're the clay. Do what you need to do in our lives. We know that we haven't been accurate representations of you. We know that you, we haven't been the best Christians. But Lord, we're making up in our minds that we're going to follow you all the way always and we're going to follow you all the way we're going to do whatever you have called us to do and so we pray that you would be with us and that you would continue to strengthen us and lord we pray that you would be with us and that you forgive us of all our sins we've all like sheep gone astray we've all checked up we all have have messed up and we've all done things that we're not proud of things that we don't even want to share with anybody else but lord we thank you so much for being loving and for taking us back and we pray that you would take that taste for sin out of our mouth we pray that you would take that desire for evil out of our mouth we pray that you would change us that you would transform us that you take away our hearts of stone that you would take away this wicked heart this heart that's desperately wicked this heart that is deceitful this heart that has nothing good in it and that you would dispose of it and that you'd give us new hearts of flesh and father we thank you for what you've already done in our lives we pray that you would never allow us to pull our hands back that you would never allow us to to go back on the decision that we have made and that you would keep us faithful and as you keep us faithful that one day we'd go home to live with you forever in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you that all God's people say. Amen.